Welcome back. He was once known, I must tell you, for a routine about words you can't broadcast without fear of the law. But George Carlin is recognized for many comic talents that are indeed safe for public consumption. He joins us now to discuss a new album, Jamming, in New York, among other tame developments, and we're pleased to have him here. Welcome. Thank you, It's John. good to have you Pleasure here. Pleasure to finally catch up with you. Yes, sir. We tried once on Night Watch, and That's it was, right. you were somewhere else. Did, when was there a change in, in, in your... I mean, there seems to me that some people think of you as sort of this... I mean, you tell me. I'm going to project okay. on you. What, it, it, what is this stereotype of George Carlin that, that is out there? It's almost like mm. he's a relic of the past rather than a guy who's contemporary, who's totally sort of no. evolved. I don't hear it that way, because okay. I, I live in here. Right. Uh, my, I, I do a home box office concert every two years, right. and that keeps me contemporaneous with all all parts of the population uh, because it cuts through age, right. um, education, uh, ev every p bit of the demographic pie is cut right through with something like home box office. So I do, I've done eight of these shows. Right. I do one every two years. So I see at my concerts, I do about 120 concerts a year, I see people from the age of 14 through 55. And um, the work, the, the current work is by my measure the best I've done, the best I've done yet. Uh, I finally learned how to do this. It was sort of on autopilot for a long do time. Do this being stand-up? The stand-up, well, the whole arc of, of creativity that, that mm -hmm. the art requires, right from the, the initial observations, the things you read, what you draw from them, the things you hear, what you retain, the notes you make, mm -hmm. how you file them, how they reach critical mass, what you pull out, how you write it, how mm -hmm. you say it, and how it finally takes shape over a period of two years on stage until you do it for the for the TV camera. But is most of your is most of your 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 year spent just going from stand up to stand up to yeah, stand up? This to is stand? primarily what I do. I, I'm also a Mr. Conductor on the PBS morning show, right. Shining Time Station, right. and I do an occasional movie Film, role. Right. But primarily, I am uh, a spoken artist, and and I do comedy monologues. And there are there are three strains that run through my work: uh, the English language, fun with words, fun with phrases, yeah. things we say. Uh, things that could be called political and social, although not really narrowly so. They're not jokes about Washington figures. But about environmentalists and about... Or killing people, right. or men and women trying to live together on the planet. Things that are truly political, right. in the true sense. And then the other is the little things, the little world. What's in your refrigerator, how you drive your car, yeah. how you tie your shoe, stuff you keep in the attic. The things that make us all the same. The big issues keep us apart. The little things make us all the same. The language is how we unite the two. So. And how much evolution has there been, though, between in the last eight, oh. ten years in you and your thinking a about lot. comedy? Well, a lot simply because I am now 55. And, right. and your, your matrix, your storehouse gets richer. You know, there's just more texture. The things you see now have much more stuff against which to be compared. So the comparisons are richer. And therefore, what you feed back out through your filter has a little more depth, w I hope. Yeah. And, and it, has, um, it has more experience behind it. It has more, um, it has more uh, a pattern to it. That, that's b the best way to put it. There was a time, in fact, uh, here, there was a time, uh, maybe several years ago, maybe four or five years ago, and, and maybe you had Roseanne and you had, uh, uh, came to television, and Richard Lewis had a television show. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of the people from Saturday Night Live were going on yeah. to make films, and, yeah. and Steve Martin became a film actor. And a lot of people were saying the best breeding ground for whatever you want to do in the entertainment world was stand-up stand comedian. Those were the people who were going on to have the most, the widest arc. Is yeah. that still true, you think? Well, I know that it is generally true that many people enter stand-up comedy seeing it as a stepping stone to sitcoms or movies. Right. to some form of acting, either, either comedy acting or otherwise. But I, I saw it that way myself in the 60s when I began, and I hit a stone wall because I flat couldn't act. Yeah. I flat How'd you find that out? I, it's on, you can see it. It's on, it's on <laughs> it's a That a Girl episode. <laughs> yeah. It's on a Doris Day movie oh, called that Girl You Get yeah. Egg Roll. Right, with Marlon. And it, I just lacked all composure at it. I, I mean, I had no instinct for it. I, I thought I did. It wasn't there. But you're in Prince of Tides? I have grown, I'm older, yeah. I'm wiser, I am more comfortable in myself now, and I can reach for things. I was a very self-conscious young man in the 60s. I was a man in the wrong skin. I was acting like a, 
a, a, a kind of middle class mainstream guy when underneath I was a lifelong rebel and a man who was out of step. And I kind of was trying to play their game to be an actor. Right. Wrong place. And it was inauthentic. It just didn't ring true. And that's why it made such a loud noise. It, it seems to me that, I mean, uh, that one thing is true about show business, and I, may, I know very little about it. It is that if you can find your own authenticity, mm -hmm. whether it's as a writer or whether it's as a performer or whether it's as an as a anchor on a television program, mm -hmm that then you at least on a step towards becoming something that because only then can you appear different and only then can you reach in and yes. and and find something unique that no one else has my my comedy didn't explode out from me yeah nor did it explode in terms of its acceptance by the public until i was doing authentic comedy until i had changed that 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 period i just described to right. you when i was sort of cardboard and doing sort of superficial right. things from the front of my mind and stuff to you with the substituting for johnny carson and all that stuff uh, that no that's later okay. uh, I'm, I'm talking now when i was guesting on right. ed sullivan guesting on steve right. allen guesting on all of these variety shows no beard straight suit right. tie and all that and doing these cute little things good material right. but superficial i was doing the hippy dippy weatherman wonderful wino the newsman, the daytime soap operas, I was imitating uh, quiz shows and things, and they were fine, but they were all parody on media. When I finally dropped that, that pose and found myself in 1969 and 70 and, and, and let my appearance change it, to be more in tune with who I was inside, that's when I began saying things that came from my gut. And that's when you did the HBO specials that sort that's of really the, caught on? That's when I began my album career, which right. led to the home box office specials. That's when I did these three albums that are in Jam and in the, uh, not Jam, I'm sorry, that are in the other package right. that's out now, a thing called Classic Gold. There were right. three albums in a row that went gold for me. They were very good for me. FM and AM, Class Clown, and Occupation Fool. They included the seven words you can never say on TV, right. which went to the Supreme Court. They included the stuff about growing up white in a, a white Irish kid in, in, in a black neighborhood uptown here. They included Catholic schooling and all the, the repression that went into that. This was when my stuff took off because it was authentic. And, and people knew that. Well, in, in looking for these words, I kept finding new categories. We have so many ways of describing these dirty words. It's, well, we have more ways to describe dirty words than we actually have dirty words. That seems a little strange to me. It seems to indicate that somebody was awfully interested in these words. <laughs> they kept referring to them. They called them bad words, dirty, filthy, foul, vile, vulgar, coarse, in poor taste, unseemly, street talk, gutter talk, locker room language, <laughs> barracks talk. Bawdy, naughty, saucy, raunchy, rude, crude, lewd, lascivious, indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off-color, <laughs> risque, suggestive, <laughs> cursing, cussing, swearing, and all I could think of was shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. <laughs> Shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. That was my original list. I knew it wasn't complete, but it was a starter set, you know? 70 was 22 years ago. If you, are you as much a rebel today mm -hmm. in terms of how you view the world I've as retreated. you were? Yeah, I've retreated from it. I've decided that if you really stay in it and think there's a solution, you're part of the problem. And so you, uh, at least from the, from the standpoint of my art. Yeah. I have pulled away, and I now reside out where the Oort cloud is, where the comets yeah. Uh, gather, right. and from that perspective, I have no stake in the game, and I can really make my commentary mean something. I don't have to think, well, maybe there's a little hope. Well, maybe this will work. Well, maybe that guy will save us. I can say, wrong, 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 uh-uh, and I can do it from my perspective. So in, in that sense, I'm, I'm more rebellious, but in the sense of being able to get along in the world, I'm less rebellious. Yeah. How about political humor uh, in terms of the kind of thing that we see a lot of stand-up, Leno, for example, doing, and Carson used to do. Well, does that, without without insulting either of them, okay. that's very, very surface political humor. It's it's sort of like Bob Hope. It's right. kind of topical, and it's about political figures. But Mort Saul would be a more accurate model for political humor. Someone who digs into the right, right. the meaning of things, uh, at least as far as we can know that. Uh, the, the, other, the others do topical, they do it well, it's entertaining, but it's not truly, to my way of thinking, political satire. When you 
how do you go about preparing um, a, a, a body of work for a concert, before a stand-up? Well, the, the pieces take form in the files. Every time I look at my files, every time I add something, I'm forced to run it through my mind again. And the constant running through those neural paths, if you don't mind me getting a little yeah. high-minded sounding here, uh, there is, it is an actual fact. The more you uh, are forced to think about something, the more connections the brain will make. The subconscious does all the work. All we do is skim it off, really, from time to time. So I let things fester. I encourage uh, myself to read my files and to, to build on them in, uh, as they're there. When you say your files, what do you mean? Just I'm talking about raw notes that have been Did put away. They're now half disk. Yeah. Uh, they're half word processor files and they're half raw paper of old-fashioned type in file folders. Yeah. I'm in the process of changing them. And every word I change from, from one format to the other changes along. I mean, each sentence grows a little. Uh, so they, they just assume a very special extra weight one day and say, gee, this thing is ready. This, I got to tell them this. This is good. I got some things that connect. It's the connectedness that makes the paragraphs. The sentences are all in there, but you have to find the paragraphs. When do you know it'll work? I mean, only after you... Can you feel instinctively yeah. yourself? You can. You'll be wrong 10 or 20 percent of the time. But, but the 10 or 20 percent of the time that you're wrong, it's because you're saying the idea wrong. You're, you're couching it. It's the delivery it. rather yeah, than the idea. Right. You haven't gotten the, par the paragraph the way it should. The idea is pretty good, or you wouldn't have written it down and saved it all, all yeah. that time. But you haven't quite got it straight. And then you'll try and try and try and try it one night by accident it will happen the correct way and then you save it. But if, if it happens the correct way by accident? Tape. I tape every show. Oh, so that's how you know. Yeah. I can, and when I know a good show, after a good show, I stop and take a few notes and say, listen to X, listen to Y, listen yeah. to Z. And, and do you the tell next by the audience or just what you feel or that's from The comment? moment. It's, it's the audience plus me. But you know, from the audience is the proof yeah. that it works. But you know in your heart that's the way it ought to sound. <laughs> I would have been out here a little bit sooner, but they gave me uh, the wrong dressing room and I couldn't find any place to put my stuff. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't have so much goddamn stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is, it's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you gotta lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. <laughs> now, sometimes, sometimes you've got to move. You've got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. <laughs> you've got to move all your stuff and maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Now imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on your stuff. <laughs> you see that remind you I mean that uh, is more you see a line from you Mortsall to you although you were in a he was sense good to me he helped me get on the Tonight Show once when I was, yeah. before I was ready who <laughs> else is in your before you're ready well in a way I, I went on and nothing else happened yeah. to me for three years who's in your family the, the, within the family of Carlin and Saul now I don't know but but because of this there's the reason I don't know because to me it seems as though every comedian who breaks through after a cer at a certain level after a breakthrough level really are unique. They're just not like each other. I mean, Seinfeld and, and Gary Shandling are not like each other. Each is really unique, and they bring you one experience, and they bring you a different one. And, and, and we all have something different to offer. I can't make comparisons. And can, if, can you find, if you look at all of them, Seinfeld and, mm -hmm. and Sandling, and, although Sandling's doing, well, he's you know, doing a cable he's show. He's doing Larry Sanders, Larry Sanders, Sanders, right. Larry Sanders show. Can, it, do they share some minimum thing other than they make people laugh or they make people think? It, 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 it has to do with a skewed attitude. It has to do with the way you filter the world. Yeah. The, the decision you made one day at, at four years of age, or maybe yeah. in, the, in the womb, or maybe at 20, when you decided one day, this is all wrong. 
<laughs> and they this don't is, understand and no, let me this explain this is them. a circus and I'm going to enjoy this while I'm here and I'll, meanwhile I'll narrate it for the folks yeah. it, it, it really has to do with that with the frame of mind the attitude toward the world here is the thing I was and this is from this is time magazine May 18th of this year mm -hmm. in which I this is where I got this idea I want to ask you about okay. Carlin is unfairly pigeonholed, however, as a leftover 60s radical, the real targets of the satire are Kant and cliché, phoniness and self-righteousness, wherever he finds them. And it goes on. This is, an, I think, a review of one of the HBO. Yeah, of Carlin the, Live the in the Paramount. Jam in New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, unfairly that's, that's stereotyped why I as that radical. idea that you somehow... Are, okay. Yeah. See, because the, the initial the, burst uh, was the long hair. Weird. I would see, what happened was, I was 30. Right. The 20-year-olds were at war with the 40-year-olds. I was 30, yeah. and I didn't belong to either of them. But my heart and my philosophy and my values were with the youth culture. I believed what they believed. Yeah. And I was making believe I was in the, for, in the 40s set by entertaining them. I was entertaining their enemies. So what, and what was the, the affinity with the youth culture? Just my values, just right. what I believed. I, did, I believed a in of freedom of expression. I, believe, I, said, I thought it was a rep repressive society. Yeah. I, I felt most of the things that were articulated by the counterculture in the late 60s and early 70s were things I believed mm -hmm. in, and I was in the wrong camp, so to speak. Do you have any sympathy? I mean, do you, are you on Howard Stern's side because of this yeah. battle he's having with the FCC sure. and this huge yeah. fine that he's gotten? Yes, of course. Uh, because you've been there. Uh, uh, well, my case, it wasn't my case, it was Pacifica Radio right, versus right. FCC, but it, but was, it was my your record. Eight words, it was my right, record, right. yeah. Um, of course. Um, you know, there are two dials on the radio, and one of them turns it off, and one of them changes the station, and what a marvelous technology that yeah. a person can if walk over and like say, it, I don't like Howard Stern, I think I'll listen to Joe Blow. Uh, the answer is never in, in, in uh, closing down the message. The answer is... Uh, you know, finding your counter argument or, or rejecting the message out of hand if you don't even want to listen to it. How how you think? <laughs> how do you think we're doing today? I mean, are you when you look at this new this election, mm. you had some interesting things said about the Persian Gulf and about environmentalism and a lot of other things. But when you look at Clinton and you look at the country today, I mean, well, I I hope more people will come to the table now. I think they will. I mean that in sense of sharing things yeah. that are material, including food. Uh, my brother had a terrific description of it. I don't vote, and I really don't. I, I, you don't vote? I, no, I don't vote. Voting uh, implies the consent to be governed, and I'll, <laughs> between you and me, I do not consent to be governed. I, a, I prefer to be true out, anarchy position. I, yes, I, I prefer to be outside of it. It, yeah. it gives me my freedom. But my brother made a good point, because we were pulling for Clinton, yeah. being somewhat left of center in general, right. not and narrowly in this Clinton country. Bush, you know, and you said Clinton. I, he said, you know, he says, I think if there were just one cherry pie and Clinton had it, I think I'd get a piece. Yeah. And I think if Bush had it, he'd keep the whole pie. And I believe that. And therefore, I'm rooting what for him. What if had it? He'd buy a hundred more pies, and I still wouldn't have a piece. <laughs> that was my addendum to, to what my brother said. But I pull for Clinton because people are going to invest hope in him. And I think people, I think, the, I think being on this planet, one of the first things people would say, if we were all dumped down here, yeah. let us say there were only ten of us, right. and we were dropping into this planet uh, already formed. One of the first things we would say was, after a moment or two would be, is everybody okay? Let's get something to eat. And that should be the first thing any society says. Is everybody okay? okay. Let's get something to eat. Right. And we don't because we have this private property thing, property, yeah. property rights over people's rights. And I just think that, that competition got the upper hand over cooperation. This species was successful. Because, uh, as part of the American experience? No, as part of the human species. The human species. The, 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 the verge of failure that we're on is because two wonderful qualities that made us a successful species, cooperation and right. competition, right. are way out of balance. Now, competition is everything. Cooperation happens after a flood. Happens for a few days, yeah, everybody goes back right. to where they were before. Happen after That's hurricane. Right. And we need, we need to get that balance back. If we can get that balance back, there's, there's hope. Some sense of community values. S communitarian idea yeah, is a good right. one. It's, it's an excellent idea. What, what was your take on the Persian Gulf War? Well, my particular take was, was, was not so much. I was using the Persian Gulf War as a metaphor or, or as a vehicle, let me put it that way, as a vehicle for a, a larger complaint that men who feel sexual prowess is everything, have to demonstrate this metaphorically through their weapons, and that rockets and bullets and, and bombs are all shaped like penises, not by some accident. <laughs> and then I used more of the language than, than, than strictly here. clinical, yeah. yes, to, to make these points that, that largely it's an exercise in 
in standing astride someone and, and, and being able to, to look down and say, you know, well, you know, America never stood tall. Ronald Reagan says America must stand tall. It's easy to stand tall when you have your foot on someone's neck. So, so it was just a complaint about militarism and about the confusion and of psychosexual. that it's an expression of, of some That it's an expression of some psych, sexual inadequacy, some perceived need to demonstrate sexual prowess mm. and superiority. That's what I believe yeah. that. I'm Are not you, alone. I didn't get the idea. It's not my no, idea. No, I know, I know, I know, I know. Is the, uh, is the record business good to comedians these days? Is that a place where you can... Um, I don't know. I, I think because cable... Cause that, they sent me these cassettes yeah. of yours. The, the, the idea for me, I mean, I'm a, I came from disc jockey land. Right, I was I a know, DJ for four years. And, and so, the career path was you going to, as you said earlier, we can go from disc jockey, yep. stand-up comedian, to, to comic actor. To be actor. an actor like Don, Danny Kaye. That was right. my model, right. 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 Danny Kaye. But it worked out well the other way. I'm glad yeah. I, I fell short at that time because I enjoyed my But have you in comedy. your mind actually fell short? I mean, have you said, even though no. you do Prince of Tides, which in a bri no, I thought I was happy with that. I'm happy. I, I can act now. I know that. You know. I just hope some other people so, will get a chance to find out. The answer so, on records is, yeah. no, they only mean something to me because they're finite, they're tangible, they can be put on the shelf, and I can point to them and say, uh, yeah. there's my like record. book. That's, that's right. Me. There's what that's I did. Me. That's what so, I did. So that's why but, I like But with Prince of Tides, yes. um, does that give you some inspiration that mm -hmm. whatever you might have stopped, wherever you came to some plateau and said, I'm happy yeah. doing this, and I'll take this, right. you might now feel a little bit more uh, momentum uh, uh, yeah. building up? To I feel I can... I can open myself up now. I couldn't do that those days I talked about when I ran into the brick wall right. and couldn't act. It was because I, I didn't know who was inside, and, and I was the last person who was going to open up and let him out, yeah. whoever he might have been. And when you found yourself, now, you then became a, had more chance of finding yourself. I have yourself more confidence in what's in there, and I can show a lot of things that um, that aren't expected of a comedian. Emotions that that we all have that I think uh, were were shown a little bit in that Prince of Time. Strice and help you. She was very good. She let me do the work. She, mm -hmm. you know, she trusted me and let me do the work, and, and to that extent, she helped, yeah. Pleasure to have you. Charlie, thank you very much. I appreciate right. it. Me My too. pleasure. George Carlin. Uh, the album is called Jamming. Jamming in New York's the new one. The old one's called Classic Gold. Um, and HBO every couple of years. That's right. Uh.